Hello and good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's talk titled Unfinding Your Roots on Goa in Novel and Film by Fulbright scholar Lucas Cole Joshi. Today's talk engages with Afro-Asian theory in the context of Goa as well as complex questions of blackness. Uh, it will be followed by a moderated discussion with uh, Dr. Vishvesh Prabhakar Kandolkar. To introduce our guest, Lucas Cole Joshi is a Fulbright Nehru scholar and doctoral student in the Department of Comparative Literature at Brown University, having graduated from Dartmouth College in 2022. His writing meditates on questions of Afro-Asian identity, post-colonial theory, and the intimacies amid diaspora. Currently, he is researching the traces and multiple forms of Afro-Asian archives here in Goa. Dr. Kandolka is an Associate Professor of Architecture at the Goa College of Architecture, Goa University, and the Program Coordinator of the Master of Architecture in Urban Design Program at the College. His research on Goa's architectural history focuses on early modern church design, as well as the evolution of Indo-Portuguese aesthetics from the colonial to the post-colonial period. His writing has appeared in peer-reviewed journals, such as Verge, Studies in Global Asia, the Oxford Journal of Hindu Studies, eTropic, the Journal of Human Values, and Economic and Political Weekly. On that note, I invite uh, Lucas to begin. Hello to all, and thank you for spending your evening here with me and with this cultural center. Uh, well, I have been in Goa for just over five months now, uh, I've spent many moments thinking about the Indian Ocean. One might say that I've been dreaming about the Indian Ocean. As vast and ever-moving as it is, there are moments when I find it so still and quiet. I say this because the Indian Ocean is a very special and a very personal place. It is intimate to us for reasons known and felt, as it is for those reasons that are unknown and still felt. There is a type of belonging I feel to this body that can never be fully pinned down. There is abundant life under the surface, as there are ancestries that refuse to be washed away. I listen to this quote especially. Here was peace. She pulled in her horizon like a great fishnet, pulled it from around the waist of the world and draped it over her shoulder, so much of life in its meshes. She called in her soul to come and see. And so Zora Neale Hurston concludes her novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Throughout the story, Janie, the protagonist, travels deeper into the American South, a journey deeper into her own blackness. Her ancestry is as much a lineage of the Atlantic as it is a roadmap toward self-certainty. Our ancestries, like Janie, are oceanic, and they are intertwined perhaps more than they stand alone. They are archives of love and kinship and violence all simultaneously. They belong to places as they belong to bodies, the human body, and the notion of skin as an intergenerational marker, and the body or bodies of water whose movement enshrines our past as it does our future. This is particularly true in the Indian Ocean world. Goan ancestries speak to this phenomenon. While Goa in the physical sense has existed in much of the same coastal place for centuries, its identity and Goanness are diasporic. As such, I look to the Indian Ocean our body of rooting and uprooting, of fluidity and sinking, as a site of Goan heritage, particularly in Goan literature. There are two works that I will present tonight. The first is the pre-statehood film entitled Trikal, directed by Cheyenne Benegal. The second is the diasporic novel written by Margaret Mascarenhas Skin in 2001. Either work explores, engages with, and ultimately confronts the violence associated with their ancestries. And perhaps further, each work illuminates the non-linear nature of these ancestries. The past is more of a today and a tomorrow than it is of a yesterday. But before we dive into both, I thought it might be enriching to hear a little more about the field of study that is associated with these questions of ancestries and the Indian Ocean. Questions that we'll see on full display in Pikal and Skin and that is the field of Afro-Asian studies. Afro-Asian studies is, in many ways, an anti-discipline discipline. That is to say, in focusing on the linkages and shared histories of Africans, Asians, and Afro-Asian peoples, it chooses not to rely on the traditional archives. 
It said, it often looks for traces that traditional historiography did not or would not record. These traces might be testimonies of enslaved peoples or stories of intimacy and solidarity between marginalized people in Afro-Asia, or even in the context of Portuguese India, an emphasis in studying both the standard Portuguese as well as the Indo-Portuguese Creoles spoken in the Man and Diu as equally valid modes of communication. At the heart of Afro-Asian studies lies the Indian Ocean. It settles atop and beneath the Indian Ocean as a body that must be studied in relation to these histories, and in particular, the transferring of blackness between Africa and Asia. But beyond theory, Afro-Asian studies is also a practice. Reading against narratives of colonial benevolence or indifference to colonized subjects. Looking at the Indian Ocean as an archive in and of itself. And perhaps most of all, disarticulating the past from the present from the future. And believing that these three, the past, present, and future, are always intertwined and always happening all at once. So we reached the film Fikal, which is also poignantly titled Past, Present, Future in English. No worries whatsoever if you haven't seen the film, but I do encourage you to see it. It's on YouTube. Uh, I hope to give just a brief context and description, followed by a more thorough look through of the themes that are ever present in the film. The Rigal portrays a wealthy Goan Catholic family in the final moments of Portuguese rule. Much of the film centers around this uneasiness of authority. Who is in charge of Goa? Though equally noteworthy, the film was produced in 1985, two years before Goan statehood. It could be said that the film takes place in one inflection moment as it is depicting another. There's also a Hindi language film posing the question that my colleague Professor Benedito Ferrao has asked. Who was this film made for? The film opens in the present with a man named Ruiz Pereira returning to his ancestral village in Goa. He remarks that so much has changed in the 24 years that he has been away. He reaches the iconic family home where he is greeted but not remembered by a man who has worked for his family, the Sousa Suarez family, for decades. The rest of the film is almost entirely a flashback, and even at points, a flashback within a flashback, before ending with Ruiz reflecting on his return to Goa. In the main flashback that dominates the film, Don Ernesto has just died. Dona Maria, his wife, is reluctant to accept his death in the binary sense of life then death. She ponders on this linear trajectory, saying, even with distance, the relation is still true. But when you lack behind time, what is left? Just a vacuum, which is kept alive with memories. This sentiment preoccupies her persona throughout the film. Her character, perhaps more than the others in the family, is profoundly theoretical. She adds, no one knows the future. We can only connect it with the past, because only the past is alive. The other character that is replete with theory is a woman named Milagrenia. She is first introduced as the illegitimate child of Don Ernesto, who was then later brought up by Dona Maria. What's interesting is she's the only character to traverse the world of both the downstairs and the upstairs. The downstairs, where all the domestic workers are, and the upstairs, where the legitimized family lives. She brings into view this idea of conditional or indebted love. That labor is then the practice in which love can be the result. Love as wages, rather than love unconditionally. Again, there's an idea of Milagrenia as a posque that she is illegitimate and brought into the family where her position occupies something in between a domestic worker and someone who could be categorized as enslaved but softened by those family dynamics. In this sense, Milagrenia is excluded, deliberately removed from the tree of the Sousa Suarez family. And yet, she is the medium between the living and supposedly unliving world. Throughout the film, there are three seances to call on the spirit of Don Ernesto. In the scene, in the three scenes really, um, Dora Maria grabs the hands of Milagrenia and the seance begins. The first time when she calls the spirit of her husband, a different man comes. And he says that he was mistakenly killed by Dona Maria's grandfather. Immediately, Dona Maria rejects this man and tells him to leave. When she is confronted with this story of her ancestry and the ancestry of her home, she denies it. In the second seance, another man comes, who is not her husband, who claims that he was betrayed by the grandfather of Dona Maria, 
and was given over to the colonial authority. He yells, this house stands on shattered hopes. In the third seance, after Milagrenia has become pregnant, there is no connection with the spiritual world. These can be considered the flashbacks to an er even earlier time already within the flashback that comprises the film. Now, on Mila Grenia, she navigates many spaces while simultaneously being denied access to their resources and their power. Again, there is this divide between the downstairs and the upstairs that she's able to navigate, although she's othered in both spaces. At one point in the film, the nephew of Dona Maria, Leon, who is an anti-colonial revolutionary, has escaped prison in Portugal and fled back to Goa. Dona Maria permits him to be hidden in the cellar, and so Milagrenia is the one who escorts him to the cellar. So we, now we have this upstairs, this downstairs, and this down downstairs that only Milagrenia has been able to traverse. She becomes this unintentional archive in that she's removed from the family tree, yet she is the medium to the family's violent roots. Milagrenia inherits a type of continuous intergenerational denial that the two men who appear in the seances were killed by Dona Maria's grand grandfather and that they were denied life and denied their presence on earth. Similarly, Milagrenia is denied family under the guise of this type of conditional love, love as wages. Toward the, film end, the film's end, there enters a discussion of life and living, as there already has been a discussion of death and dying. Beyond the life part, living comes as present in the four elements, water, fire, earth, and wind. Dona Maria has a vision of her own, and from it concludes that Dona Ernestu is now present in all four of these elements, and that those elements are all that remain of each and every one of us. We have nobody else but ourselves. In a way, we inherit ourselves. We are the keepers of an archive that existed before and will surely exist beyond this life of ours. As the film draws to a close, Ruiz ponders on his return to Goa. Perhaps for the first time, he acknowledges the possession of Milagrenia by the family, saying, she was brought up like a commodity and transformed from feelings to reality. Now, the house stands abandoned by its original inhabitants as it is also transcending time and space. Ruiz is not remembered by the village as memories of Dona Maria and Milagrenia are beginning to disappear as well. Begging the question, who would remember the house had existed if not in the physical element? Which, if any, of the four elements does the house occupy? What becomes clear is that the past, present, and future are not separate nor un unknown from each other. It's quite the opposite. All three are codependent on the other. Ancestries transform from archives of the past to roadmaps toward the future. And if the future and past are simply alternative forms of the other, then the present becomes not this moment in time, but instead a perpetual degree of proximity to either. And so arrives the Indian Ocean, a body that, like Trikal, disarticulates and dispossesses the past from the present, from the future. If we are to think with the Indian Ocean, let us begin in its tidal sequences, the cyclical nature between low tide and high tide. During the high tide, water reaches farther and farther across the shoreline. We notice the rising and crashing of its waves like we had never seen them before. And yet, it is during the low tide, when the same water retreats, that we see a glimpse of the undercurrents, so to speak. What lives beneath the tide, this liminal boundary between low and high, that is an archive that sinks deeper and deeper with each cycle, and so sink our stories. The novel Skin adds its own commentary to this discussion about a non-linear temporality, that is a past, present, and future all at once, anchored with themes of blackness and enslavement in the colonial era. Like Thikal, if you're not familiar with this work, no worries at all, but I do encourage you to read the book. It was published in the year 2001, and like Thikal, goes back and forth between the present moment and flashbacks, though this has much of the present day narrated by the protagonist, Pagan. In a sense, this novel is a multi-generational, autobiographical account of Pagan and her life. 
As an adult, Pagan returns to Goa and spends time in particular with one person with whom she shares a profound ontological connection, the self to other to self kind of connection, with a woman named Esperanza. Esperanza comes from a long line of black women who have been enslaved, both formally and informally, by the Goan family. Pagan tries to recount her family's history in Goa. She remembers different narratives of wealth and business and expansion, but with each narrative comes more questions about the nature of her ancestry. And so she approaches Esperanza for answers. As a child, Pagan learned from Esperanza about Zamba, an African goddess, an exotic mythical being, wild and free as the wind, dark and silent as the depths of the sea. She was, Esperanza said, the mother of life itself. But the most fascinating aspect of the goddess was that she could change her skin and metamorphose into the shape of any living thing at will. Can she be an elephant? Yes. What about a monkey, a bug, a bird? Yes. Can she be a tree? She can be anything she chooses to be. And a man. Can she be a man? Yes. She could be a man if she has to be. Esperanza explained that the goddess had different names in different places, that in some places she was called Zamba or Yamba until the men of the tribes became angry because they could not have babies. Then, to pacify them and let them feel they had participated more fully in the process of creation, she assumed her man form and became Nizambia. So that the men would feel not left out of the creation process, she taught the mothers to say to their daughters, the zombie has made you, my child, inside me, just as he will make a child for you someday. It is also from Esperanza that Pagan learned about the Vacha, the mischievous wood spirits of Goa who live in the trees, about how she should not hurt the flowers by yanking them from their stems in the garden, about how to commune with the spirits of animals and thank them before eating any of them. Each person, said Esperanza, also had an animal spirit. Pagan carried these bits of knowledge deep within herself like prized secret treasures. Esperanza and Pagan sit side by side, their backs against the wall on a mat on the floor of Esperanza's mud hut. Now, Esperanza occupies a kind of post-colonial archival role. That is to say, she is not the archive of the de Miranda Flores family. While much of what she shares with Pagan details the violence and exploitation performed by the Goan family, her oral tradition, her body of work, is dedicated to Afro-Asia. In this way, Pagan's family is almost decentered from the narrative that recounts their colonial enterprise. What is centered, however, is a type of oceanic blackness. That is to say, a legacy and practice of blackness that, despite being removed over and over from the narrative of colonial Goa, continues to resurface, like a buoy in the deep ocean, always afloat and always in sight. Throughout the novel, the boundaries of Goa are distorted, pushed beyond. In accordance with the oral tradition of Esperanza, the blackness present in Angola, in Africa, and in Goa existed before and after any one colonial empire. There is a black future. Blackness, depicted by Esperanza, is the roadmap onward. There is a black present, the moment of right now in which Esperanza's oral tradition lives skin deep. And finally, there is a black past, but not past in the sense of it being over. If I were to pose a question now, it would be this. If our future is informed by our present, and our present is informed by our past, what informs our past? One answer might be that it's that past before the past, or simply put that past past. Others might say that what comes before the past is not a deeper past, but instead an origin. But what does that origin look and feel like? There is one more excerpt from the novel that I hope to share tonight. It provides a full circle moment, a deep closure to a trauma pagan, the protagonist, bore witness to in her youth in elementary school. It involved her and her black friend Yvonne being othered by their white peers. There was one day when Pagan was offered a spot in the white friend group if she agreed to ignore, to unsee Yvonne. She told Yvonne about what they had said, 
and Yvonne told her parents what they had said. And then her parents made the decision to transfer her to another school. Pagan and Yvonne did not see each other again for many, many years. Here, Pagan adds the next and perhaps final chapter to that friendship. During a visit to Bombay, I attended a lecture at the Alliance Francaise by the renowned African-American novelist, poet, and cultural anthropologist, Yvonne Lafayette. We met afterwards, and she spoke of a film she was producing based on her highly acclaimed autobiography entitled, White Magic is Really Black, a book written in prose so raw and wonderful that it tore my heart. I have never been proficient at summarizing books, but here is what it says on the jacket cover. The opening chapter recounts the humiliation of a six-year-old Afro-American girl, Yvonne, whose white schoolmates distribute bits of quartz among themselves, with the idea that these stones will magically prevent them from being contaminated by Yvonne. The young Yvonne's suffering is mitigated somewhat by another outsider, a girl of part Indian origin, her only friend. Yvonne loses her friend when her parents transfer her to another school. We spoke animatedly and at length of her anthropological work. I also told her of mine. And some months later, I received a substantial donation for my construction from the Lafayette Foundation. The final element I will meditate on comes from an overarching theme of the novel that also happens to be its title, Skin. Skin is living and breathing as it is inherited, an archive in its own right. On the epidermis, our topmost layer, we see color, a physical though not definitive marker of the me and the we. But what does skin resemble in the context of the Indian Ocean? Skin that was born of the Indian Ocean. This oceanic skin, if we can say such a thing, sinks under its own epidermis. It is less of a bridge between Africa and India and more of a mirror of the other's past and presence and futures. In that mirror, we see our own reflection looking back at us, but it's an autonomous reflection that we do not have control over. When we move in one direction, our reflection stands still, and when we are still, our reflection moves any which way. It is then that our collective histories shatter the mirror's glass. What's left is not one reflection, but multiple, each looking to us from a different direction. Benedito Ferrao writes, the oceanic past stretched like a skin between continents, evokes networks that twins the Indian and Atlantic oceans far before the globalization of the current moment. By twinning those oceans through the history of forcibly removed black bodies, skin brings to bear on the present by reminding that Africanness can take many forms in many places, even as it is remade and renewed. Though displacement and loss inform the present, it is the engagement with the past and the contemporary moment that critically assesses cultural legacies of race, class, and gender privileges. The two works, now side by side again, have similarities that jump out at the reader. Probably the most apparent is the focus on Goa, Goanness, and Goan ancestries. The ways they navigate these questions vary. For Trical, Milagrenia plays the role of a medium to the family's violent roots denied inside and outside the walls of their home. And for the novel, Esperanza emerges as the living archive of the Indian Ocean and its skin. Milagrenia and Esperanza are both simultaneously integrated and denied access to the families they labor on behalf of. They are not the key to their respective families' ancestries as much as they are the ancestries the proof of the past as synonymous with the present, as synonymous with the future. Each work in taking us deeper and deeper into the Indian Ocean world also transport us beyond it to an ocean that to date has no name. I mentioned earlier that Afro-Asian studies is a bit of an anti-discipline discipline, and here's what I mean by that. Often we're taught that there's a binary between the Atlantic Ocean world and the Indian Ocean world. But these are two separate worlds that have different histories that never interacted or colluded with one another. But the reality is, and something that we see quite often in the colonial history of the Portuguese empire, 
both of these oceans were simultaneously traversed in the trafficking of enslaved people. The oceans collaborated with one another. They spilled over into one another in order to make these trafficking processes successful and diasporic. This idea that the Indian and Atlantic Ocean are separate, and perhaps more, that the oceans don't know the name or the body of the other. Additionally, this binary tells us that there's enslavement throughout both, but that they're not related, that they're under different oceanic names and therefore different pasts and presents. So, Afro-Asian studies seeks to unmake this type of foreignness of Atlantic and Indian oceanography. And now, I would like to read an excerpt from a chapter that I've written for an upcoming novel. I think about and with skin, our skin, and what it means to be submerged, to have our skin submerged in the water in whatever form it may take around us. We are untruthful to our skin. We are the same as water. Still, we submerge our hands, knowing that hydration and dehydration are betrothed to the other. After the waterfall, there is a brook, and then a stream that topples headfirst into a river, a river that gives way to the sea, an ocean that knows its origin, and then an archive. It has not a name, but a body that remembers what it cannot live. Ships carried people and bodies atop our Indian body. There were many who began and ended their journey on a shoreline. The sand they first sank, sunk into now rests with us, and so we built a castle anchored by its stories. If you look closely, you can see it when the low tide calls. The tide is always high. We are but our wet skin. Thank you. there that we can feel our skin. Yes. <laughs> Not a sweat yeah. of the day, but a chill. So yes. some kind of other experience in the world. So it's interesting, and I want to start a few questions that I want you to perhaps elaborate upon or uh, take it further. But I want to start with the binaries, the question that you put up. And you made one connection to the binary, which is Atlantic Ocean versus the Indian Ocean binaries. And you quoted around is saying that yes it is there but at the same time there are other connections which stretch across but there are other binaries including the Lusso world versus the Anglo world in which Goa is intrinsically a part of there are binaries of colonized and the colonizer which sometimes we see as simply very clear-cut divisions there are also binaries of gender which we don't, again, once again, Foucault and other things that we So we'd like to elaborate on how these binaries inform some of the works that you do and how do you stitch them together or keep them separate or... You know, sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question. I think the challenge with binaries is, in addition to the concrete either or, it can at times prevent us from thinking that there was any sort of interaction or dialogue between the two. Um, in the example of, for example, colonizer and colonized, um, you know, Goa speaks to that, that while there was a clear Portuguese authority and there were colonized subjects, there were also um, a number of Goan families who benefited from their proximity to the colonial authority. And so in those binaries, um, it's less of looking for a concrete answer in a way to respond and more of trying to unravel this idea of it being one or the other um, in, in that way, for, you know, with the idea of the Atlantic versus the Indian Ocean world, what it prevents us from thinking is, if it's under a different colonial name, then there's a different colonial subject. Um, I was once talking to Professor Fadal uh, about um, uh, the heritage of the U, the island. Um, and so my father is Gujarati and my mom is biracial black. And so what we were talking about is I was so fascinated by, um, you know, communities in Diu, and that there are some, you know, who have both Gujarati heritage and African heritage. Um, and so when we were talking, I was tempted to say, oh, you know, 
you know, these people have similar ancestry to me, but under, you know, completely different circumstances, completely different names, to which he reminded me, well, how different is it? We might have ended up in completely different parts of the world, but it's under the same idea, the same oceanic name. And so trying to move past the Indian and Atlantic binary brings us to this theory of trans-oceanic systems of enslavement, that we're looking at the collusion between the two. And in that way, we can go deeper into what ancestries may overlap. Um, and so I think working to unravel some of those binaries can be very beneficial in, um, well, it's gonna sound a little cheesy, but unmaking more than we're making. <laughs> There's also, it's not a binary, but many layers, but that of caste and skin does bring that out. So this whole question about Africa and Africanness gets further complex because the way we understand and want to relate to and identify ourselves to the idea of caste. So here, for instance, the connections to Africa is often not openly engaged with or there's a problem in engaging with and Africa is not a one single small nation. Uh, people, scholars will tell you that if you put Africa together, you have Europe and you have many parts of the world. Um, both of Americas together, and it will still not be enough. Yes. So we speak about Africanness or Africa, and especially in the Indian Ocean world, and especially whether it's Goa or India, that connection gets lost because of the blackness. And I would say there is this other binary, which is black and various shades of grey or black, which mm -hmm. is not the opposite. So it gets lost, and that's where the caste comes in. We want to elaborate a little bit on caste, or if you have thought about it in, in the ways that you think about. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, I am by no means an expert on, on caste. Um, and while there are many similarities with how caste appears in Goa, there are also differences with the greater India. Um, I would say with caste and skin, there's a type of um, superficial element, and I mean that plainly in the color of your skin, the shade of the skin. And from my knowledge, oftentimes, the type of shade of skin is connected to the type of labor that you perform. And that if you're out in the sun all day, you're more likely to have darker skin. And so, um, what's interesting is when, um, you know, enslaved people were trafficked from Africa to Goa specifically, um, there was a type of um, uneasiness, I think, between, uh, I don't know if uneasiness is the right word, uh, questions of, of hierarchy when um, Africans were here um, and low caste peoples were also here, questions of now who has the higher position. Um, in many ways, people would argue that uh, those who performed uh, labor in low caste were enslaved under a different name. Um, as Africans were also enslaved under the name of the Portuguese. And so I think with caste, it, it adds a complexity because that also transcends the colonial world, you know, pre, during, post. Um, so I would say with, with skin, especially and with Margaret Mascarenhas' writing, um, I think it illuminates that although um, there was um, ample conversion from Hinduism to Catholicism, that caste didn't disappear. Much like blackness, it was, to some degree, attempted to be removed by the authority, but continues to resurface and resurface. A few more questions. <laughs> um, I want to go to, to the movie Trikal, and I like the fact that you were able to point out the subtitle, which is past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And that's when Goa's history with that of rest of India becomes complex, because mm -hmm. uh, it's, Luso history, it's Portuguese history, but kind of the, to the Indian Ocean world in a very different way than India, which is under the British, would be connected. Right. So in that sense, the formation of the nation state and where we start identifying identities in the nation states gets dominated by uh, the idea of nationalism, a particular kind of nationalism. So Goa doesn't fit very comfortably right. in, that, in that narrative. But at the same time, often as histories go, and it's not that the skin or the books or this movie is doing that kind of history. All these things get a little complex. So how does the notion world help us to unpack or undo this nation state histories to that of oceanic histories? Right. I think the simple answer might be is the Indian Ocean actually makes it more complex <laughs> and, and a little more difficult to unravel. Um, I think like the position that Esperanza occupies in skin um, in her oral tradition, it places 
and directs a narrative of Goa in which Goa is almost decentered from its own story. And in that way, we're looking at the Indian Ocean world um, more broadly than one nation state or one prominent community within that oceanic world. Um, there's a line that I love that's, um, the North wanted to build worlds in the South, and the South had worlds in its worlds. And so that speaks, I think, a little bit to the oceanic history as well, that there are multiple worlds all at once, simultaneously. And when looking at Goa in this lens of the oceanic world, it also brings about thinking, um, thinking with and thinking through archives in the non-traditional way. So thinking about the traditional archive, ar archives and the four walls that they occupy. There's a type of confinement of the information there. But thinking about oceanic archives, we also have to think in terms of you know, the ocean and oceanography. How does salinity impact this archive, the tidal cycle? Um, and so even notions of historiography and archives become you know, oceanified is a word, <laughs> but um, they become unraveled. And so unraveled is almost the goal of Afro-Asian studies, which can be, well, quite frustrating uh, at, at certain points. Um, but it's so uh, prolific about placing things within the context of greater and greater things and never being able to locate or to make one thing the core. It's almost like putting the periphery into that core position and making the world around it a greater um, proximity to the periphery. Uh, speaking of archives, both now I'm joining the, the Trikal mm. to skin and both speak about how uh, bodies of the women were archives mm -hmm. of Africa, Africanness, in the case of special skin. Right. So as a as an archive, and this is what Farah has uh, written about, is that as an archive, it's often because there's a certain kind of relationship between uh, patriarchy and women who are enslaved. Mm -hmm. So there's certain kind of power dynamics between that. But at the same time, it's an archive of uh, the skin itself, yes. the dermis. Yes. So in that sense, it's an archive of violence, mm -hmm. absolutely, patriarchal violence, yeah. forced violence, uh, rape even. And on that, in that sense, but there is also this parallel that although it's an archive of violence, it's also an archive of survival. Absolutely. And it's not often. So would you like to, uh, there's one, there's one uh, quote which you can, uh, I pick up from Saram, but it's a quote which says that our mothers live under our skin. Uh, it kind of brings out more than, than, uh, right. than simply terms. So in, in terms of that, would you like to say a few words? Absolutely. And, and that quote by Farah um, also speaks to this type of um, idea that we, I think when we talk about um, our bodies, there's a type of um, autonomy that is placed um, within our understanding of bodies, which is a powerful thing, bodily autonomy. But at the same time, thinking about skin as intergenerational, it's almost like we're dispossessing our bodies. And in that way, our bodies become not, um, you know, one line in a tree, but instead a vessel of, you know, ancestry's past and, and you know, alternative futures. And so I think with um, skin in particular, and I don't want to spoil the book if you haven't read it, but <laughs> with that being said, a, revel a revelation that comes towards the end of the novel um, with Pagan speaking with Esperanza about this type of narrative of, of her family in the greater context of Goa is that Pagan also um, is a part of that matrilineal line from Esperanza. And so perhaps unintentionally, maybe intentionally on the part of Esperanza, Pagan is continuing this matrilineal oral tradition. And so in that way, the skin lives, the dermis and beneath the dermis. Um, and so I think, like the quote that I had shared um, from Farao, I love the idea of skin stretching out between Africa and Asia, between the two oceans as well. Um, and, you know, it's a profound thing thinking about self-dispossession, if we can say such a thing. Um, and I think skin, although it's the most superficial and most obvious element of us when we see each other, it's also that roadmap towards unseeing, right, and, um, and disarticulating ourself while also understanding the greater context of our, of our family trees and our ancestries tied to the Indian Ocean. We belong to the Indian Ocean, it's true. <laughs> Blackness cannot be erased uh, culturally or physically. It is uh, 
here to stay if only we can see. Uh, with that note, uh, I would just like to open this. Uh, if there are any questions, we would like to take. Just introduce yourself so that you can then follow with your question. My name is Gautam. I'm his student. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, racism uh, is a kind of a vi uh, visual discrimination because skin color is visible. And coming back to the question of caste which Sir to talked about, caste is kind of an invisible discrimination because it, it's not based on uh, some kind of visual element until and unless you come to know about the birth of that person. So how these two discrimination which are uh, Theoretically, uh, they look opposite, but how do they understand each other better? Thank you for the question. Um, I think, uh, um, thinking about it from a perspective of inter intersectionality, really any and all sy systems of discrimination um, do not work alone. They collaborate with one another. And so, um, in terms of racism and caste, they, um, they befriend each other because they have, the, they have a common goal, and that is um, oppressing, making a distinct core and a distinct periphery, and making a distinct um, line in the sand between us and them. And so I think, you know, especially in colonial history of the Portuguese in Goa, um, they were able to take the existing social hierarchy that existed, um, you know, uh, between the Hindus in Goa, and even as Hindus converted forcibly to Catholicism, so much of that um, caste structure remained. Um, and then, of course, we see you know enslaved people when they're brought to Goa. Well, what caste do they occupy? And so, there's almost a type of um, rigidity in the caste system because even as more and more marginalized people are brought to Goa, right, enslaved people from Africa they don't fit into any one caste. The caste system doesn't open up to include them, yet it still manages to suppress them and to um, you know, keep them at a distance. And so, uh, to go back to the core of your question of racism and caste, um, I would just again say that systems of discrimination, they don't work alone. They work at their best when they're in collaboration with one another. Um, and I think we see that a lot, especially in Goa's history, um, and particularly throughout India and the Indian Oceanic world. Thank you for the question. Hi, I'm Shashwat. Hi. And my question was on, again, power relation, colonization. One of the most brutal processes, in statement, one of the most brutal processes but uh, there was a phenomenon which in up north we call Gizmetia, which was endangered servitude, uh, where people from gangetic plains were taken to work in Guyana, Suriname, Fiji, uh, and all those plantations. While being very brutal, at the same time, they were sort of air quote liberatory, because through that process, what happened, what like, a lot of scholars call it Brahmanization by boat. Because when you had a working class population of Hindus on a boat, mm -hmm. and they had to come up with a socio-economic dynamics among themselves, they realized, all right, we can have a priest but without any power, and then they denoted one person or one family to become the priest. That led to a very liberatory process. So, maybe that is also one perspective, like, fine, we get ocean was very, very violent to those people, especially from indo gangetic plains sort of a nugget of information, there were stories of people, they were not, the people in Indo-Gangetic plains were not even aware that they were thing called ocean. When the first time they saw ocean, they thought it's a very, very big river and uh, Ganges and they thought if they would swim across it, they would reach their village. So they started swimming from Suriname, hoping they will uh, reach India or their village somehow. Anyway, so that ocean, and then there was a lot of work on how that uh, led to decastifying the Indian diaspora in all those plantation society, and they called themselves Chakni society. 
because the, the what you do with chutneys, you take few ingredients, you mash them up real bad and, until you can't differentiate one from another. Right. And that's what they call it, that yeah, we are chutneyfied society. So maybe that's also, it was a bit liberatory process as well. Right. Anyways. No, thank you for that. It's, it's a wonderful point and it goes back a little bit to what you had mentioned that um, as much as violence is archived in skin, Sorry. as much as violence is archived in skin, there's also a profound survival in it. And um, what I hope to convey to some degree tonight is when I say the word ancestries, it means the past to a certain extent, but it's also the period of what's yet to come and that that future and past are simultaneous um, in action. And so I completely agree that there are elements of the ocean as liberated. Um, because if there wasn't liberation in the ocean, um, I'm not sure we could speak of Afro-Asian, you know, oceanic history. Because there has been, you know, solidarities between marginalized people in India and in Africa. But through what vessel? And that vessel is the Indian Ocean. And so, um, the Indian Ocean is almost this simultaneous site of belonging and ancestry and violence and mourning and inspiration all at once. And so that's a wonderful point about liberation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I think uh, I don't need a mic. Thank you. Yes, but it's recorded. Oh, recorded. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, my name is Amol. Yeah. I, I, this is my observation about Trikal. There is one uh, particular character, Leon, hmm. yeah, you know, who yeah. marries Anna. So now he's a revolutionary, uh, agreed to the first uh, half, uh, he wants to liberate Goa and when Goa gets liberated, he doesn't want to stay here, he goes to Portugal, settles there, right? So he's moving away, so different ocean altogether, okay? This is one thing I would like, I mean, you can elaborate like he's big. It's a, it's a movie, okay, fine, you need not need to. This is one observation, as he said rightly, uh, Indians were taken over uh, to Caribbean islands in Suriname and but you know, Currently, I don't know, but whatever I've read or whatever I've seen, I, I think their lifestyle is much better comparatively. And I just want to uh, compare it to one uh, African uh, tribes who are here for the last 800 years, the Siddhis in particular, in Karnataka and maybe Gujarat. Gujarat. Yeah. So, yeah, your state, right? Uh, no, Daman, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> so, the point is, still, they are not in the mainstream, you know. I don't want to confuse you because I took you to Lyon and to Suriname or whatever. So, so yeah, so what would you like to say on that? Okay. Um, first with uh, Lyon, it's, um, it brings me back to a scene from the film, actually that he was not a part of, but um, the three men sitting around the table talking about the future of Goa. And uh, the doctor saying, well, you know, aren't we Indians if we're Goans? You know, what's the difference between the two? And the second man saying um, that, you know, Goans are Portuguese citizens and that Portugal will protect us. And then the third saying, well, Goa should be its own country. Yeah, it separate, should be like Switzerland. Yeah, yeah like Switzerland. Yeah, That's yeah. right, like Switzerland. Yeah. That Francis, the uh, little on yes. our colleague guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, who's always falling asleep in the lap of yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> the woman he's pursuing. Yes. Um, I think with Leon, <clears throat> it's interesting that there's a character like him in the film. This, you know, outwardly anti-colonial revolutionary and that he occupies the space of the cellar so far removed from the grand house um, I think what that does for the film um, is it highlights that there's complexity in the response to Portugal from Goa that not everyone was in favor of continuing Portuguese rule even if they had a proximity to the power right they're living in this huge mansion you know they have a lot of wealth um, uh, well they would be speaking Portuguese, which is a, a kind of a joke that the movie plays on, that they're speaking in Hindi, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> translating into Portuguese. Um, uh, so with, with that, I would say his character occupies almost like, um, he, like he's the representative of the anti-Portuguese um, kind of movement in Goa. But at the same time, that movement is so relegated and kind of moved away from the narrative. Um, so we see more of a narrative of colonial benevolence and that you know people in Goa were... Um, sympathetic to Portuguese rule and wanted to continue it. So it, it does add a layer of resistance. Um, now, about the cities in Karnataka and Gujarat. Uh, I worked a little bit on the subject, um, profoundly um, moved and, and, and intrigued um, by these um, communities who persist to this day. Um, I know that there's been some uh, ethnographic and anthropological work done with the city communities. 
Um, and uh, I think those people might be a little more qualified, the people who have done the work, um, to, to speak on it. But what I will say is um, uh, there is an Afro-Indian legacy in India and beyond India. I can say that being Blindian myself. Um, and so I think what's important in looking at that is blackness to this day in India is still relegated to a periphery within a periphery, right? Um, it's almost like a sub subaltern within within the context of India and South Asia. And so, you know, I think the position that um, descendants of enslaved people occupy is uh, it's archival, right? That they are um, the descendants and survivors of this type of enslavement and trafficking and forced diaspora, as it is um, a legacy of colonialism being over in name only, that it persists to the day, even in the post-colonial era, colonial is still the majority part of the word in post-colonial. Um, so I think, no, I think, you know, afro gujarati people, Siddhi people um, are, you know, a part of this African diaspora and what Benedito Farao speaks of, this Africanness everywhere. Um, yet it's not um, a community that is um, talked about or really support it or given the benefit of government resources and social programming. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, and, and view as well that there are um, Afro-Indians and, and Indians who still occupy the island. Um, and that is that non-linear temporality, right? The past, present, and future as simultaneous and codependent on one another. But thank you for those thoughts. Appreciate Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's, I think so it's been, it's been lovely, measured, uh, Discussions and good to have some questions. Um, I would like to uh, kind of end with the kind of that there is this whole stretch about focusing on many studies, but we in Goa here are to some extent uh, ignoring or there is work being done, but there's more needs to be done, which is Goa studies, which simultaneously connects to Anglo Indian studies, to also. African studies to Indian Ocean world, and even like the way the, the uh, novel skin shows trans ocean world. So if we just focus on Goa studies, perhaps so it, it does have a very uh, important role because we can speak about so many connections. So in that sense, Goa is central to many discussions and dialogues, which uh, I think so people here would have appreciated. So thank you so much. It's been lovely to have you and to listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time.